So it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you to the organizers again for their invitation. Um, I'm going to be beginning with the end of the story, that is to say the idea of historical progress. We just heard uh, other speakers mention how for much of the early modern period, there is no strong sense of history as progressing, although there is a sense of change in history. Um, however, by the end of the 18th century, we have not only the idea of progress, but we have, in fact, the, almost a, a, a strong ideological investment in the idea of progress um, in what becomes one of the key texts of the Enlightenment, uh, which is the one written by uh, the Marquis of Condorcet, uh, the, a sketch for a historical picture. I'm, I'm not reading from the, from, the, from the English translation that was published almost immediately. A sketch for a historical picture of the progress of the human mind which offer the philosophical history of the progress of liberty and enlightenment, Lumières, uh, uh, against the forces of tyranny and superstition or error, which are two concepts that Condorcet often combines through, three, uh, through ten epochs, from the origins of society um, uh, uh, to, uh, to the future. In essence, the last epoch is the future. And it is uh, inspired largely by the stadial theory of the history of civilization that many Scottish uh, writers have been working on, but it actually becomes uh, uh, more complex. And even though it's not a very coherent text, it mixes lots of things. He wrote it in tragic circumstances. Uh, he was in hiding, and in fact, he would, be, uh, he would die in prison after the French terror in the revolution to which he had strongly committed to um, turn against him. Um, and so it's an interesting text also for the context in which he's written, because even while he's in hiding from the terror, he is proclaiming the importance of the revolution, which is, I mean, in, in essence, the, 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 the acquis d'un tableau historique de progrès d'esprit de main is, is a synthesis of the themes of the enlightenment that you, you could associate with the radical enlightenment rational free thinking, religious toleration, civil and political liberty with a republican sense of political society, liberal politica, uh, political economy, he himself was strongly concerned with economic management, but he also was very active in promoting equality through education and in humanitarian cosmopolitanism, including pioneering works on the rights of women and the denunciation of the slavery of black Africans. All this, Condorcet projected towards the future, a future of indefinite progress and social equality uh, which would follow the revolution. And the revolution was in itself the culmination of a series of revolutions that began with the Dutch revolt against the Spanish, against Philip II, went on with the English Revolution, and then the American de Declaration of Independence, and then the French Revolution. So there is here a genealogy of political revolutions connected to a version of the Enlightenment that believes in progress. Uh, the fundamental inspiration for this idea of progress was the progress of learning, in particular in the natural sciences. The assumption of Condorcet uh, that let us emphasize not everybody, no, not all his contemporaries agreed with that. His assumption was that a scientific revolution with new methods could be a model for a political and social revolution that would involve what we would call liberal constitutions, human rights, and as I said, the rights of, uh, of, of, of women and black people, for example. What is there to object to this other than an excess of optimism at the time when the author was himself in hiding because the very revolution he had supported had turned the terror against him too. The particular reasons for that was that he was part of the Girondin party and his proposal for a constitution was rejected. The Jacobin uh, constitution was proclaimed. He questioned it and that was too much. So all the tolerance, all the tolerance that uh, and really free thinking that he that he saw the Enlightenment being about was no longer alive within the terror. Interestingly, wherever Condorcet departed from Montesquieu or Rousseau or many other writers that he 
uh, summarize, because he was not less a thinker than someone who collected ideas and put them together. Um, uh, whenever he departed from them, is, it was essentially in order to be optimistic about human nature. I mean, uh, when Rousseau emphasized that human perfectibility was balanced by human corruption, uh, in the case of Condorcet, he invests his vision in the idea of perfectibility. And he complains that whilst a skepticism against Catholic dogma was great, a skepticism in his radical uh, taking too far goes against belief in the future. So he rejects the skepticism too. So his enlightenment is a system of philosophical faith. We could continue discussing wha what went wrong afterwards. I mean, all his um, cosmopolitanism was very Franco-centric, and it would be rocked by the rise of linguistic nationalism. Um, and we could say also that in, in parallel to his denunciation of slavery, for example, we find a revival of colonial imperialism. And just at the same time, just about the same time as Condorcet is is, is writing uh, his esquisse. Uh, at the same time, we find that the British are conquering Bengal and India and William Hodges. Uh, 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 I'm just showing him one of his engravings of his travels through India in those years, published at the same time in London, uh, uh, offers this image of an Indian civilization which is stagnant and in decline, and in essence, in order to move forward, they will benefit from the paternalistic rule of, of uh, the East India Company uh, that at the, at the time William Hastings was very much um, in the process of incorporating more and more territories under its jurisdiction. The reason why Condorcet is useful uh, as a starting point for us is because his, the, the, the vision of historical progress that he articulated so passionately in the midst of his own tragedy was only made possible by the intensive use of comparative methods in the previous three centuries. What I have els elsewhere called, um, and here let me mention an interdisciplinary volume to which I contributed some of the materials I'm discussing today, uh, uh, called uh, Regimes of Comparatism, which is, um, by the way, something you can download for free in the University of Bielefeld if you're interested. So you can do it as I speak, you can all download the book if you're interested. Uh, which is it's an excellent book, it's an interdisciplinary book brings together anthropologists, historians, and classicists primarily. What, I, the, what we discussed in that, I mean, the conceptual uh, proposal in that book was the idea of regime, regimes of comparatives, meaning that was comparison is an essential activity for human beings in order to know and articulate knowledge. The way it functions in different historical and cultural contexts and intellectual contexts varies and therefore you can distinguish different regimes of comparatism that apply to different fields of knowledge in different periods and in different societies. And what I'm saying is that in the Enlightenment there is a specific regime of comparatism that is the result of many, many centuries, in fact 300 centuries you could say, of systematic comparisons around two axes. Uh, two axes. Uh, one axis is the one that opposes the moderns to the ancients. Ancients and moderns. And an idea of modernity develops in Europe to begin with in relation to the distance that's increasingly found between the ancient world and the modern world. The whole humanistic movement, of course, is a recovery of classical knowledge. And you could say that the Renaissance in itself begins as a revival of of, of the arts, learning, and prosperity, and economic prosperity in Italy and elsewhere in Europe. It, however, at some point very quickly becomes something else. It becomes also about how the moderns are different from the ancients in ways that allows you to talk about superior technology and knowledge. And the, the great navigations are a good example of that emphasis or the way the printing press is interpreted as having had a crucial role in disseminating ideas and making it harder for the ideas to be suppressed. And this is not my argument, this is the argument 
of Condorcet. And what's interesting about Condorcet is not whether he's right or wrong, is that he articulates an interpretation of European history in his own times and in the previous three centuries as a history of progress. Progress, he believes in progress because he believes progress is already happening, has already happened. And the fact that the ancients, for example, didn't believe you could, I mean, didn't, uh, didn't have a problem understanding of the globe because geographic, the geographical ideas were conditioned by the inability to navigate what was Europeans have been able to navigate and circumnavigate the world. And this is, of course, the earliest, I mean, from Columbus and Vasco da Gama all the way to Magellan's voyage now 500 years ago. All this is, is created a sense of accomplishment and possibility that emerges in Europe in parallel to more negative discourses like the, the corruption of the church. I mean, we heard about the Reformation, for example, the Votio Moderna today. So it's not as if everybody is celebrating progress in the 16th century, but there is a discourse of progress connected to technology, geographical discovery, um, and then the whole idea is about torrid zones, the antipodes, all these which appear in Augustine, for example, uh, get demolished um, uh, very quickly. Um, but this was also, um, um, uh, uh, this was one axis, there's another axis, which is the axis that opposes Europeans to non-Europeans. Because at the same time that they are navigating, Europeans are discovering, conquering, colonizing, exploiting, trading, across the world. So the sense of progress in technology and learning is connected also to an experience of cultural diversity. And this is what my main topic is. How the two interact. They're not two separate things. The two continues, continually, uh, continuously uh, in, in, uh, inflect each other. The way Europeans will look at other societies is influenced by their sense of the way they relate to their own classical past. And the sense of modernity in relation to the classical past inflects the way they interpret their encounter with the societies. Now, to do a full account of this would require uh, uh, um, much longer than I have, so I will offer a very brief sketch, if I can go back to uh, to, to, to Condorcet's words uh, of, of how this works. Um, but I would begin by simply saying that there are three debates that were crucial to this trajectory of interactions between comparisons across time and comparisons across space. The first debate are the implications of cultur cultural hierarchies for colonial imperialism and its missionary strategies. The second are antiquarian reconstructions and constructions of universal history driven primarily by religious apologetics in the light of biblical accounts of origins. And the third big debate is the philosophical analysis of religion and civilization with a growing emphasis on defining Europe's modern cultural identity and with a growing emphasis also on rethinking human nature anthropologically. These are the three things that emerge of these comparisons throughout the early modern period. So let us begin with, with the translation of cultural diversity in the encounter with the new world. Um, when Europeans first began to write natural histories of the New World, like Gonzalo Fernández de Viedo, the Spanish uh, first, uh, chronicler of the Indies in the early 16th century, they begin to already discuss the problem of false analogies. They have tigers there, but they're not the same as what we call tigers in Europe. Lions, we call them lions, but they're not quite the same. There are some fruits there, like the pineapple, that are different but others that are analogous to the ones we have. And when Ferdinand Cortés or other discoverers talk about the mosques, then later on someone writes in the Codex Mendoza, one of the earlier kind of uh, attempts to interpret uh, Nahuatl writings um, uh, in 1541, he presents, well, they're not really mosques, they're more like temples. And they're not really alfaquis, they are 
just priests of a different kind. So there is a sense in which there's a process of cultural learning, of linguistic learning, um, um, which, which identifies false analogies on the one hand, but also imposes, and this is the other side of the coin, Eurocentric categories on materials that, uh, uh, that do not naturally, within their own cultural tradition, accept those concepts. And here I will talk about uh, what might be perhaps the, the most, one of the most famous examples of comparative ethnography in the 16th century, the, the work of the Franciscans in New Spain, in Mexico, uh, and in particular, La Historia General de las Cosas de, de Nueva España by Bernardino de Sagún, uh, who is the, the culmination of a whole tradition of interpretations of Nahuatl culture. And as the image itself shows, uh, the famous Florentine Codex, which is just one of the many versions he wrote. Uh, um, I mean, there is a, here a sense of translation in action, um, the Nahuatl text, which in 12 books tries to describe various aspects of Nahuatl culture with the Spanish translation next to it, and uh, also with the images, which are also quite well known. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that this is an effort of cultural translation, which requires a lot of thinking about what are the right concepts to translate, what are the right words, what are the differences, what are the similarities. However, however, there is also a false image of equality in this image you're seeing here. Because this is not about one culture interpreting the other because we just want to know about another culture. This is about a missionary engaged in a process of conversion who wants to find out what is, where can we identify idolatrous beliefs that we must persecute and destroy. So it, in fact, it's a tool for destruction of what's considered to be idolatry. And idolatry is one of those concepts I mentioned that would make no sense whatsoever in an Amato cultural tradition. It is an export, an export. Uh, it is in fact one of the sharpest tools used by Europeans in their forced acculturation of subjected peoples. So this um, leads me to, to, to one of the key results of this encounter, which is the sense of cultural hierarchies. There are different cultures, there is an effort of translation, but there is also a strong sense in which the, the, there are barbarians and civilized. However, however, and this is the interesting bit, it's not a simple dichotomy of barbarians and civilized, it's increasingly a gradation of different degrees of barbarism and civilization. And we find that very clearly, and we go back to what we were discussing Giovanni Batero and his sources earlier. I mean, José de Acosta, in his Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, one of the most influential books ever written uh, about the Americas. I mean, it was influential from its appearance in 1590 all the way to the time of Condorcet. It is an essential book. Is in essence, a Jesuit who tries to say, we cannot think about these Indians as just an amorphous kind of mass of barbarians. They have different levels of knowledge, and we need to distinguish between those who live uh, like savage animals, uh, and those who live in small communities, and those who have states with religion and with uh, organized, uh, with systems of writing maybe. And then he enters into disquisition between different kinds of writing. The Nahuatls use pictograms. He then compares that to the Chinese and says, but the European system of alphabetical writing is superior. So uh, 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 a claim to superiority, and this of course was by taken by Botero, uh, uh, a claim to superiority is connected to the classification of cultural diversity in a hierarchical manner. And technology is crucial. Navigation, again, we alone have the navigation to cross the oceans. The printing press, the Chinese have the printing press, but their system of writing is less effective than ours, and so on and so forth. There's a number of themes that appear in these writings. And in the East, Alessandro Valignano does a parallel work. He says, basically, yes, the Chinese and the, and the Japanese are, are almost are very rational. They're as rational as we are. They're not less intelligent than we are. And then he adds a racial element to the classification, going back to the previous talk as well. Um, they are white like us, and they are as intelligent as we are. 
and then he has a basically saying he is, is develops an alternative theory of hierarchies of civilization, which is already a racial one. It's already about the darker people are less capable of rational civilization, and the white peoples are the most capable, and that means the Japanese, the Chinese, and us, but especially us. Because besides having the true religion, which of course is always an element, we also have the arts and technology that are better. So our scientific achievements and our technological achievements are better than theirs. And to these, a new theme will emerge soon, which is, and our politics are better too. And this is the image of despotism that will be applied to most of the monarchies of the East, although in a polemical context throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, culminating in the work of Montesquieu. I'm jumping some things because I don't have time to go through absolutely everything in as much detail as I would like to. But I'm just adding this as one of the themes that will be added in the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, I mentioned cultural hierarchies in a context of colonial imperialism and its missionary strategies. That was the first point. The second was about antiquarian uh, uh, debates and constructions of universal history. And here I would like to, well, I would begin, I would like to first mention very quickly one of the interesting debates of the period, which is the debate about the origins of the American Indians. This is the debate that Acosta begins, but then continues throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. And it is a very interesting debate because it's a debate that begins with a theological problem. I mean, um, are these people full human beings that we are responsible for as Christians to convert? And this is, the answer is clearly yes, that's the Catholic answer, they are human beings. That's the whole point of founding your empire on religious justifications, is that you have to convert them to Christianity. However, 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 where did they come from since there is no navigation? And then Acosta uh, speculates they must have come uh, by a land bridge, and this becomes one of the, the dominant theory in the period, uh, before they had finished exploration of the coasts of America. However, what's interesting is that at some point, Hugo Grotius, best known for his uh, discussion of the rights of war and peace, uh, intervenes with an idea, well, if you compare their language and their word, uh, you can see that they come from uh, Scandinavia, Norway, they're basically Norse. And that kind of comparative methods used to sustain genealogical speculations whose ultimate origin is biblical because we must have common origins because the Bible says so. That is the fundamental starting point. That will, um, will lead to a, a reply by uh, the Dutch, another Dutch person, Johannes de Latt, who says, your comparisons are rubbish, basically. I mean, I'm translating from 40 pages of complex Latin to an English idiom, but basically that's what he says. Um, um, and that, what I w find interesting about that debate is that it exemplifies very clearly how these antiquarian issues become a testing ground for deciding what is a good comparison and what is a, what a bad comparison. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, this has gone, this happens sometimes that if I don't keep touching it, it goes to the, to the wrong uh, thingy. Okay. So this is one of the many debates, but there are other antiquarian debates, and I'll go very quickly now. One of the most famous works of comparative ethnology uh, in, the, in the early 18th century by um, Lafitteau, uh, uh, his uh, um, uh, uh, customs of the American savages compared with the customs of the ancient times, goes back to one of the fundamental uh, axis of comparisons I mentioned. Uh, as I said, there's one across time, one's, one across space, well, they're coming together. Time and space, fundamentally, are equivalent. The savages today are like the savages in the past. And um, the, um, the distance between the modern European is defined now in relation to both a past of barbarism and the present of alternative barbarism. And so, so we have a triangle, the coming together, the two axes. It is a, a, a massive work of comparative, of comparative uh, uh, kind of uh, customs, whose whole raison d'etre is not to do modern anthropology or ethnology, but to justify his own Christian apologetics, 
there is one thesis that makes that book necessary, which is to say that all the barbarians of the world have vestiges of the primitive religion of mankind. When Adam and Eve were created, we we'll go back to the biblical myth of origins, at that point already there was a fundamental natural religion that every single people of the earth has inherited and despite all the ignorance and distortions of the ravages of time, it's still there. And if you look at the image, and the, the image that the frontispiece, it has someone sitting down, and that person who sits down is the historian comparing. And the two genius are offering a comparison of objects from the Americas, from Canada, which is where Lafito had been a missionary, with um, the quality is not great, but with the idols of the East and of the, of the past, the Babylonian, Egyptian. Basically, all those Egyptian and Babylonian kind of like um, religious objects are compared to the objects that you can find, like the pipe um, in, in the Americas, and all the rituals. So you, co you, com you compare customs, you compare objects, and you say they all have a common origin. So here, it's the, like in the case of Acosta, you find science driven by religious ideology. And the key word is conformité, conformity. It's the same. It might, look, it might look different, but it's the same. And the paradigm is common origins. But there was an alternative explanation for differences, for conformité, which is parallel developments. And this is what the anti-religious writings of the Enlightenment will emphasize. This is not about common origins, these are fantastic constructions based on false analogies. This is all about parallel developments. And we will find that in parallel with the appearance of Lafitte's book, there is another book, which is Ceremonies et Coutumes de tout le monde, Ceremonies and Customs of All the World, by, uh, edited by Jean-Frédéric Bernard, uh, appeared in the same year, 1724, which is a compilation of all the customs, uh, religious customs of the whole world. And the point about that comparison is to say, well, essentially, all religious traditions are fundamentally foolish and irrational. And the original religion of mankind, he doesn't deny math have existed, was a simple one. But it's now degenerated through mechanisms of corruption and the priestly manipulation, manipulation of, of the capacity for error. And here there is a very important figure, intellectual figure, which is Pierre Bell, which, is, um, which in essence had argued uh, for the idea that um, 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 all, all paganism was not about a distorted version of the truth, it was just about the capacity of humans for religious error and for irrational beliefs. And this it becomes one of the anthropologies uh, of the Enlightenment. Um, and, uh, and we tend to think erroneously that Condorcet's optimism is the model, when in fact, for much of the 18th century, the anthropology of the Enlightenment is also about the human capacity for error. And much of the debate of the Enlightenment is about how do you educate potentially rational human beings into being effectively rational human beings. That is the real debate of the Enlightenment. How do you go from potential rationality to real rationality? How do you fight ag against fake news in modern worlds? That was the debate of the Enlightenment, interestingly enough. And here Condorcet is not the main model, he is the extreme optimist compared with those who are much more cautious about the idea of historical progress because they know they're fighting against a real possibility of error and manipulation. Let me finish with a couple of more images. One final book I wanted to, to show is the one, uh, one, one, one of the many books compiled, compiled by um, by Bernard in his Ceremonies of the World, which is um, the conformity of the customs of the Oriental Indians with those of the ancient Jews. Now, what's interesting about that book, written in southern India in the early, uh, in the early 18th century by uh, an officer of the French East India Company called Lac Requinier, uh, is that it is saying, well, listen, I'm, I'm no theologian. I can't understand all this religion of the Hindus by looking at their texts because they're very hard to access. And I don't know the language. He doesn't know Tamil, uh, Sanskrit, let alone. But he says, I can observe their customs. And through that, 
I'm going to compare them with the ancient Jews. And that so, so it's, it looks like an arbitrary comparison. But he says, no, because we see what you find is something in common. They all don't want to change. They're all essentially not moving. And the comparison here leads to a very different direction from Lafito. This is no longer Christian apologetics. This is now what I called the anthropology of the Enlightenment. What he's saying is that what it shows is the way traditions basically create customs that enshrine religious beliefs that are irrational and create stagnant societies that refuse to change. And it ends with a very interesting dialogue set at the time of the conquest of Jerusalem by the Romans, the times of Titus, the emperor, in which two people debate about whether what would be better for the Jews if you basically um, force them to become modern through conquest by becoming Roman, obviously, or let them be with their customs and beliefs because maybe that makes them more virtuous and happier people. And that is, of course, a reflection on on what's beginning to be the imperial dilemma, dilemma of Europeans in the 18th century, which become much more powerful in the 19th century, which is, do you force India to move out of its corruption and the stagnation? This is, of course, the image they have is not necessarily what's going on in India. That's clear, isn't it? But it is, is the image used to justify the British conquest of India. The, 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 there was an ancient Indian civilization that stagnated, then came the Mughals, which on the one hand destroyed, on the other hand created more powerful empires. Akbar is the model of the great Mughal emperor who is tolerant and enlightened, but it degenerates into religious fanaticism. It's now all falling apart, it's corrupt, it's despotic, that concept again, despotism. We need to come and change them for their own good. And so essentially, we go very quickly from belief in progress to believe in empire. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much.